Happy Father's Day and welcome to City Line Online. We are so glad you're here and would love to get connected with you. One way of doing that is by saying hi in the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from or joining us at one of our virtual lobbies every Sunday at 1 p.m. During our time together, we will be engaging in some worship, having some intentional teaching and learning how to get more connected with City Line. So let's celebrate together. Welcome to City Line. Today we are so excited to get to worship with you where you are. We want to encourage you to stand and to clap and to feel free to dance if the spirit so moves. We want you to be able to worship God the way you feel most comfortable. Join us as we worship our God today. Our God is great and glorious. We put our trust in your name, Jesus. Able to save and deliver us. We put our hope in your name, Jesus. Sing blessing, sing and honor, glory and power.
Hallelujah. We sit in your presence as we worship before you. At your feet we fall. homes, on this stage, in our yards, together with our families and friends. God, your power is amazing. Power over all, God, over the darkness, God. We speak it over the darkness. God, your power is greater. You are stronger than any disease. than any division, God. Than any chaos, God, you're greater. And we declare your peace. We declare your love. We declare your grace and your salvation, your power over it all today. God, we need your mighty power. Oh, that your spirit would fall afresh on us that we would be a light in the darkness and we would carry it with us wherever we go, God. Oh, how we need you. Help us to walk trusting you each step of the way, trusting you for the words coming out of our mouth and that we would fill our hearts with your word, that whatever would come out, we know would point to you, God. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Oh, how we need you. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Hey, City Line Church, friends and family, thank you so much for tuning in to this online service experience. We're so excited to have you with us. Today is going to be a great day because we are jumping into part two of a brand new series called Can't Stop, Won't Stop. So as you begin to prepare for that today, we also want to encourage you that today you have an opportunity to continue to worship God through giving. Uh, giving is just one of the ways that we worship God at City Line Church. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your ongoing generosity. Thank you for choosing to put God first in your life, in every area of your life, including your finances. Because of your generosity, we have the opportunity to impact our cities and communities around us. So thank you. And let's not forget, today is a very special day. It's Father's Day. So dads, we have something incredibly special for you. I just wanna wish all of the men, amazing men in our lives, a happy Father's Day. Just a small town girl Living in a lonely world She took the midnight train Going anywhere Just a city boy Born and raised in South Detroit He took the midnight train
take that. <laughs> I'ma put in work. You can't stop me. That's what I'm talking about, right? I mean, that's, that's the jam. Hey, I just want to welcome you right now to City Line Church. And I just want to stop by saying, hey, happy Father's Day. It is Father's Day weekend. Today is Father's Day. And we honor all the dads out there. We honor the grandpas. We honor the uncles. We honor all the men who have stood in the place of that father role. We, we, we want to commend you. We want to honor you. We want to say thank you uh, for just being willing to come alongside and be a mentor, to speak life, uh, to continue to encourage. And, and here's what you need to know. We need you. Men, we need you. We need you more than ever before to, to step up, to be good examples, to continue to lead the way, to continue to love well and to lead well. And we just want you to know that we thank God for your life. We thank God for what he's doing in your life. And we know that God has so much more in store for you. We're excited that you're with us. Also want to say, hey, what's up to those tuning in from your watch parties, wherever you are watching from. We are so excited that you are watching together in community with other people. We pray that you are enjoying your watch party. We want to say thank you for helping us kind of gauge readiness as we prepare to integrate back on the campus. Um, and so I want to encourage you, stay tuned. We have some more updates for you this coming week. Um, so make sure you're staying tuned on Instagram and Facebook. Make sure you're checking out the City Line online website to stay aware of what's going on and the next steps that we are taking as we continue to celebrate Jesus together. Today, today we're going to dive in because last week we started this brand new series that we're calling Can't Stop, Won't Stop. And this is an important series for us. It's a series that, that really helps us kind of be recentered on who we are. Because I don't know if you recognize this or not, that, that what happens is in, in, in a crisis, when, when things go crazy, when, when things are not as we thought that they would be, we tend to, to struggle in that we begin to forget who we are. We begin to forget our identity. We begin to forget the, the things that God said about us, not only as people, his people, but as who we are as the church. And so we want to we want to kind of focus in and be reminded on, on who we are, that as we process what's going on in our culture, as we process what's happening in the world around us, we have a role and a responsibility in it. And we want to be absolutely clear. We want to create alignment. We want to have clarity. We want to have focus. Why? Because the church is a movement. This is a movement that is known as the church. It's God's people. It's the body of Christ. And here's what's so great about this movement. Matthew 16, Jesus makes a bold prediction. He says that he would build his church and not even the gates of hell would would stop his church. Not, 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 nothing would come against God and his church. Nothing would come against what God wanted to do in and through his church. That, that means when, when everything else begins to fade, when everyone walks away, when, when things don't turn out like you thought they would, Jesus said that nothing can stop what he wants to do. He can't stop. He won't stop. And we believe that God is still at work that he's inviting you and I to be a part of it, right? This movement, it's, it's relentless. It's a desire and a drive to see change, to, to, to see healing, to see wholeness, to, to see restoration. It's this unstoppable drive to see what Jesus prayed, that, that your kingdom come and your will be done right here on earth as it is in heaven, right? There's always been a gathering of people who understood that the church is a people and not a building, that, that we are the church, that, that we get to be a part of what God is doing around us. It's a people that understood, like, like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4.20, for the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. It's actually living by God's power. We're not here just to, to talk about nice ideas. We're not here gathering together just to kind of ha ha have nice thoughts about, about things moving forward in our life. No, no, no. We're here to understand who we are as the body of Christ so that we actually begin to live it out in all of its power, in all of its authority, being who God has created us to be. And there's something so exciting about that because there's, there's nothing that has been more influential than God and his church. 
There is nothing that has stood the test of time like God and his church. So just let me ask you something today as you're thinking about that, as you begin to process the significance of what God is doing through his church. What is the, the absolute craziest thing that you've ever done? I mean, just think about it. Some of you, you don't really have, have much to say, my guess, is because you, you, you just kind of, you don't, you don't do a lot of crazy things, right? Uh, another way to phrase that would be like, what's the, what's the boldest thing that you've ever done? Right, that, that, that thing that, you, that immediately comes to mind. I mean, something that really took guts, like like something that you had to dig down deep. So you see, my guess is there's some of you that you know exactly what that is, and you remember the day, and you know the feeling, and and, and you felt that experience all through your body. There's others of you that, that you're searching for. What is that thing? Have I done anything super crazy? Have I really done anything that's been I don't know considered bold? And here's what I want to suggest. You know why we're searching to find something? It's because if we're honest with ourselves, me included, we tend to play it safe. We tend to go through life just, just kind of like maintaining certain levels of comfort. We, we want to keep things manageable. We, we don't want things to get too crazy. I mean, our world is crazy enough, we say all the time, right? So we don't want to make things crazier. And now, don't get me wrong. You should be safe, right? You should live a life that's safe. I mean, especially in times of a pandemic, right? When, when, when there's all kinds of misinformation out there and everybody's confused on what exactly we should do, you, you, should, you should be safe. But that's not exactly what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when is the last time you've done something that actually stretched you? It challenged you. I, I mean, it took a lot of courage to do. It, it, it made you stand out and, and be different from, from maybe what everybody was doing around you. Again, as you think about that, I need you to understand there's a big difference between daring and dumb, right? <laughs> Let's just be honest, right? Like, like, like I'm not talking about just doing something wild and, and, and crazy. There's a big difference between faith and just foolishness, right? I'm talking about this thing that it was for the right reason, that it required you to step up and, and be bold, Here's what I want to suggest to you today if you're still wrestling with that. And this is why I'm trying to hone in on that feeling and thought. It's simply this. Belief determines behavior. Belief determines behavior. Now, now just think about this for a second. If you believe that everybody's going to criticize you, chances are you're going you're gonna to behave tentatively. You're going to be a lot more apprehensive. If you believe that you're, you're probably going to fail at whatever it is you're choosing to do, then, then guess what direction you're going to go probably the way of failure. If you think that, that, you know what, that you just can't get it done, then, then what's going to happen is you're going you're gonna to constantly begin to second guess yourself all along the way. But here's what I know. If you believe that Jesus is the son of God, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the one true God and that he is calling you out and that he has a purpose for your life and that he's empowering you and leading you to make a difference in the world around you, then here's what happens. You begin to live differently. Or do you? It's a question. Why? Because belief determines Behavior. Belief absolutely determines behavior. Last week we said that, that there was the, this group of people that believed in Jesus, not just in what Jesus said, but they saw the risen Savior. They listened to the words of Jesus. And as they were waiting for what Jesus had promised, that he would give them a power that was not their own, they were in the upper room. And suddenly, as they were praying, the Holy Spirit shows up right? Fills the room. They, they were filled with God's power. They hit the streets. And from day one, after Peter's simple message about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, suddenly you have 3,000 people saying yes to Jesus. It didn't stop there. They continued just days later sharing the message. And Luke, Luke, who documents the book of Acts, he records that another 2,000 people said yes to Jesus. We believe in this Jesus. We believe in who he says that he is. And we believe that Jesus can do what he says that he can do. And it didn't stop there. When we're picking up the story today, you don't just have 3,000 plus 2,000. Luke documents there's another 5,000 men that heard about the good news of Jesus Christ, heard about the power of God through Jesus Christ, and they placed their faith in Jesus. Now understand, if you're trying to count the numbers, you have to recognize that in Jerusalem, this is not a huge city. This is not Los Angeles County, right? With hundreds and thousands of people, you're talking about 60 to 70,000 people, and now suddenly you have 
10% or so of the population saying yes to Jesus. You have 10% of the population now begin stirring and moving and living their life differently because of a man named Jesus. Now, now you know what that means with this movement? It means that the movement was moving, right? It means that the movement was, was doing big things, but in them moving, here's what we know. The movement was unsettling. The, 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 the movement was, was pushing against status quo, and as it was pushing against status quo, it threatened the, the religious control of the day. People were up in arms about this new movement known as the way of Jesus. And there was this tension. There was a lot of resistance. There was a lot of pushback to, to what was going on. It was, there was pushback to Peter and John's message. In fact, if you're following along today in your notes or if you want to check it out on your, on your screens at your watch parties or in your house, we're going to go to Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, there, there, there was a lot of energy in the city. Remember, the Pentecost festival had just taken place and many people had stayed a few days after because of the phenomenal things that they were experiencing by the hand of God at work. And Peter and John one day were walking to the temple. They're, they're going to, to worship God and they see a guy who is laying on the side of the road who had been lame for 40 years. He had been lame for 40 years. Now, that doesn't mean this guy was like, you know, like, I don't know, a weirdo or like, no, it means he couldn't walk, right? He was lame. It's like lame Larry. Like Larry can't walk. He, he's been that way for 40 years and he's begging. His, his life has been reduced to simply begging. He can't work. Nobody cares about him. He's the marginalized. He's the outskirts. But, but there's something different about these Jesus followers. As they walk by and Larry begins to beg, lame Larry says, says would, you, would you give me some money? And I love what happens, right? Peter looks at him dead in the eye and he says, silver and gold, I don't have any of that. Now, why is that so significant? Because if you remember, if you just think about this, right? Peter, Peter was one of those guys that chose to surrender all to follow Jesus. Peter, Peter was a fisherman. P Peter knew what it was like to, to, to catch the catch of the day and to make money off that. But instead, he let all that go to, for something better, to, to choose to follow Jesus. And although that didn't seem very lucrative, listen to what happens. He says, silver and gold have I none. He says, but I'm willing to give you what I do have. And he says, and in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And as Luke begins to document, says that the man got up and suddenly his legs became stronger. His ankles became stronger. And as he did, he began to dance a little bit. He began to get excited. He began to celebrate the goodness of Jesus Christ and what God was doing in his life in that moment. And then suddenly all this controversy breaks out. People are amazed by what just happened. I mean, how did this happen? I mean, Peter and John, I mean, what, what's so special about these guys that, that suddenly... Someone that we know that has been in this condition for 40 years, now his life has been radically changed. The temple leaders couldn't, couldn't handle it. The, the, the religious elite, they, they were so disturbed because of all this talk of the, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and, 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 and everybody clamoring about, about the good news of Jesus Christ. And so you know what they did? They couldn't take it, didn't know what to do about it, so they threw Peter and John in jail. Let's, let's just lock them up. You want to stop a movement? Let's just take the leaders of the movement and let's just kind of, let's just hold them. Let, let, let's not allow them to continue to, to, to share what they're sharing, to, to rally the people. But, but the next day, the next day they were brought in for questioning, right? They, they, they were brought into what's known as the Sanhedrin. If you know anything about the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin, they're, they're the religious court. They're kind of the, 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 the main religious law keepers of the day. These are the ones that thought of themselves as just Always being the good guys from the very start. They're the most holy, the, mo the most, the most honorable, keeping, keeping to the Jewish law. And they brought themselves, they brought Peter and John before the Sanhedrin and they said, who do you guys think you are? And who gave you this kind of authority to walk around saying what you're saying and doing what you're doing? And, and I love this. For most of us, you would be like, oh man, what do we do? If you, if you got locked up for doing a good thing, if you, if you were, were now held captive and you're not allowed to, to share what you needed to share any longer, you would have been nervous in this particular point in culture, right? Because, because people knew this Jesus. 
but nobody liked Jesus. And there was this group known as the Sanhedrin that not only were the religious law keepers, but they did not believe in a resurrection. And because they did not believe in the resurrection, they were not willing to listen to the story, much less their power was now endangered. And so you would think that Peter and John would have been nervous, that they would have been scared. But you know what I love about Peter? He's just an opportunist, right? Here's Peter sharing the good news, right? And, and, and all of Samaria, Judea, he's trying to go be a witness, right? Like just like Jesus said. And now, now he finds himself in front of the high court. He finds himself in front of the religious leaders and he takes the opportunity to share about Jesus. He says, well, guys, you know the story. You know about this Jesus, right? He, Jesus came. He says, I've come to give new life. The kingdom of heaven is at hand right here, right now. But you guys couldn't take it. And so you guys falsely accused him and you killed him. And you did so by nailing him on the cross. He says, and I know it sounds bad. He says, but I got some good news. Jesus, when you buried him, he didn't stay dead. And the good news is he was raised to new life, right? He was raised on the third day and he's here to give you new life. I love that. And the Sanhedrin, they're, they're freaking out about it, right? And then, and then Peter, he makes this bold statement. He says, and here's what you got to understand. There is salvation in no one else. You're not going to find rescue. You're not going to find peace. You're not going to find hope. You're not going to find healing in anything else. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. He says, you can't do this for yourself. You can't keep a list of rules and think you're going to be okay. You can't just have a checklist of things that you do to make yourself feel holy. He says, that's not the way it works. You know how you receive salvation. You know how you get forgiveness of sin. He says, it's in the name of Jesus through a relationship with Jesus. I love that. Peter, John, they stand there before the court unhindered, seizing the opportunity in that very moment. And then listen to what Luke records next. He says, the members of the council, they were amazed when they saw the, here it is, Boldness. You might want to underline that, circle that. You might want to put a star next to it. You might want to look at somebody next to you and say, boldness, because we're going to talk about boldness in, in the next few moments. And it's so important that you get this. He says, he says, they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see, they could see with their own eyes that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They're just, they're just two ordinary guys. They're just two ordinary guys who absolutely love Jesus. Now, now, here's what you need to know. If you don't read your Bible, I think you should, because the Bible is actually kind of hilarious, right? Especially especially when you hear some of these stories and what happened, especially when you, when you, you start to learn some of the, the, the meanings behind some of these words. I, I mean, I, I understand this, right? They, they recognize that they're ordinary, unschooled, no training, just regular everyday Joes, right? The Greek translation for, for ordinary is the word Idiotas. Idiotas. Now just think about that for a second because some of you are like, you know what? You know what? That, that, word, that word sounds familiar. Right, right. Well, well, the translation in Greek is this. It can mean unlearned. It can mean unschooled. It, it obviously means ordinary. To which you say, but, but wait, time out, Pastor Jack. That, that sounds a lot like, like our English word, uh, idiot, doesn't it? Right? And some of you know, right? You're like nudging each other at your watch party, you know, because you probably called somebody that on the way there. You know, you got frustrated, you got you know, a little bit of road rage, you know what I mean? Maybe your spouse or like what you know said something mean to you today, even on Father's Day, right? Like the reality is idiot, right? They were thinking, I don't understand these guys. These guys are unschooled, they're, they're ordinary people. The literal translation is that the council was amazed at these ordinary idiots. Standing in front of them, uh, fearless, fearless, but, but rather with boldness, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ as if they were given some sort of special authority that they couldn't fully understand. But here's what they recognize. There was no doubt about it. Make no mistake about it. These men, they had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. They understood Jesus. They knew the relationship with Jesus, and in spite of them being themselves, being unschooled, being ordinary, guess what? God, he specializes in making something out of things that appear to be nothing. It's just God's plan. It's just who he is, and it's what he does. And then he doesn't leave these guys hanging. God, God did something powerful through Peter and John's faith, and that he healed, remember, Wayne Larry, 
right? They're, they're looking here and they're like, what can we say about these idiots, right? We can't really say anything. Why? Because we recognize that these men, they've been with Jesus. And even more so than that, guess what he says? He says, but since they could see the man who had actually been healed standing right there with them, there was nothing they could say. Why? Because everybody else was so amazed. They were like, yeah, let's give it up to Jesus, right? Let's give it up for, for, for Peter and John and the boldness of their faith. I mean, look at Larry. I mean, Larry's still over here dancing. You know, he's still doing his things. Like, look, my, like, I mean, he's fired up, right? And the council can't say anything. Why can they not say anything? Well, because they would have experienced severe pushback for, for, for doing, causing harm to somebody who did something so good. So you know what they did? They said, you guys, stop it. All right, we can't take this anymore. We're giving you a final warning. We, we do not want you to talk about his name. Now, what's fascinating to me is they didn't even want to say the name of Jesus. They didn't even want to utter the name of Jesus. We're just telling you, you have to stop saying the name of Jesus. Now, again, if you're following this story, if you're Peter or John, I'd have been freaked out in this moment, right? This would have been like, like as soon as they slapped me on the hand, they said, okay, you, you got to go. Like, can you imagine them leading the council and then looking at each other like, what just happened, right? Like we were just going to the temple, right? We, we ministered, we gave what we had, which was the good news of Jesus Christ. That was a life-changing moment in someone's life. Next thing you know, we're arrested and then we're thrown in front of the council. And then Peter, you preach the good news in front of the council. It's, like, it's crazy, right? Like, they're, they're, I mean, what would you do? You know what they did? They ran immediately back to the rest of the followers. They, 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 they rushed back with their core group of people who were gathered, waiting, wondering what's happening. Now, imagine the trauma that they're experiencing. They had watched and heard about Jesus dying, being crucified, buried, right? But then Jesus rose again. And they're all fired up about Jesus and new life. And they're all fired up about Peter and John's message. But now the leaders of this first church are now thrown in jail. And they don't know what's going to happen. My thought is they would be very reminiscent of what it was like to have no hope and, and to, to just going back to being scared and being frustrated again. But as you continue to read Luke's account, you see something very different in these Christ followers, right? I want you to lean into this for a moment because as Peter and John went back to talk to them, their response to the resistance that they were experiencing, their response to persecution, which could have negatively affected their livelihoods and their reputations, they actually responded with something powerful. They, they went back and they shared what had happened. They're like, you guys are never going to believe this, right? Like we were going to the temple, right? Meet, meet our friend, you know, like, like he, he can walk now. I mean, you can imagine like they're, they're, the story's all broken up, right? And, and then and he's like, we're, we're standing there in front of the council. We said something. I think they called us idiots. You know what I mean? Like they laughed at us, but then they couldn't do anything about it. And then they said, they told us just go home and stop talking about this thing. What do we do now? I love this. I love this. When they heard this, this is what Luke said. When they, when they heard about what had happened to Peter and John, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Wait, time out. No, no, no. They would have been like, whew, that was a close call. All right, everybody, we got to be a lot more quiet about this Jesus stuff. Okay, everybody, listen, listen. You know what? We can't, we can't um, afford to have anybody else be arrested in this moment uh, or else the movement will, will never get out of the first century. You know, so let's, let's just be a little quieter about our message. No, 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 no. no. What, what did they do? They, they heard what had happened. They heard the commotion that had been stirred. They heard about the danger that was going on and they didn't resist it. They didn't shrink back. Instead, together, they began to pray to God. They began to lift up the name of God. They begin to say, God, you are so good. God, we are confident in you. God, we know you're active and at work. God, even when things look different and we don't, we're confused on how this is going to work out, we know, God, that you are with us. And then I love what Luke documents next. He says, and they begin to pray and they said this, and now, O oh Lord, now, O oh Lord, hear their threats. Hear what we're experiencing. Hear what's going on. And now, God, we're asking you to give us, your servants, listen, great boldness, great boldness in preaching your word. It wasn't, oh, oh God, 
we're so scared and we're so freaked out. And oh God, we're so overwhelmed by what's going on. Like, like we're not sure what to do. No, no, listen, they knew exactly what to do. They begin to call out on the name of Jesus. And as they begin to call out on the name of Jesus, they weren't just praying for protection. They weren't just praying for provision. They weren't just praying, God, make our oppressors go away. You know what they were saying? God, God, would you do something and stir something within us so great and so powerful that you give us great boldness in preaching your word, no matter what may come our way, no matter what the resistance looks like, no matter what people might try to say about us, God, we know your word is true. We know it's life-changing. We know that we've got to get this message out to those who are desperate for it, who need it. Why? Because hope and healing can only come by you. I love that. They didn't stop there. They said, God, give us great boldness. And then they begin to pray this. God, stretch out your hand. Imagine this. Can, can you get a vision for this? God, stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your servant, Jesus. You know what they were saying? God, this is not about me. This is not about give Peter and John and the rest of us more power so that when we go out and we do things, people are like, whoa, look at Peter and John. Those dudes are amazing. No, no. He says, God, we, we don't want the attention to be drawn to us. God, we, we want the attention to be drawn to you. Jesus, we, we want to we want to live our lives in such a way that you are glorified, that everything that we do, it begins to honor you. So what we're asking you to do, God, is stretch out your hand upon us, God. Lord, stretch out your hand and with your power and with your miraculous signs, with your wonders, God, would you do something phenomenal in the name of Jesus? We're just thankful to be a part of it. We're just happy that you invited us to say, would you be a part of this movement and our answer? answer is yes, Jesus. Yes, we're willing to be a part of this. Listen, don't, don't, don't miss this, right? The followers of Jesus, in the face of opposition and persecution, they did not shrink back. Instead, they chose to lean in. Why? Because the characteristic of the church from the very beginning was great boldness. Great boldness. From the very beginning, the church's very beginning, boldness was what the church was known for. Jesus, give us great boldness. Now, let's just, let's just, just pause right now, because I know you're like, man, Jack's all fired up today, you know? It must be the new haircut, right? It must be Father's Day. You know, he just must, I don't know, maybe just having a really good day, right? He, he, I just want us to pause. I, I, want, I want to think about this for a second. Can I ask you a question? Uh, uh, think about your prayers for a moment. Think about the things that you're praying about this moment. Think about the nature of, of, of your prayers. And if you, uh, the things that you're praying for right now, the, the things that you think you really need, if all those things were answered, what effect would it have? Would it only benefit you or would it actually benefit the world around you? It's just an honest question. I'm not trying to call anybody out today, but, but I am trying to, 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 to arrive at a moment of awareness that, that maybe we've lost some of our, our boldness that maybe instead of reaching out and trusting God for big things, for greater things, right, for the things that he wants to do in us and through us, that for whatever reason, we've, we've shrunk back a little bit and we've forgotten who we are and we've forgotten who God is. And, and you know what? Our prayers have just become this, God, just get me through the day. God, God, just God, just do this one next thing. Oh God, I don't know what. I, and instead, God is saying, would you continue to trust me for bigger things, for greater things that not only affect you, but would you allow me to do something in you that it begins to change and affect the world around you. I'm telling you, I want to preach today to somebody. I'm praying that the word of God is coming direct and clear to your home today, to your watch party today, wherever you are watching from, because I want us to understand this. And here's what I love. When you begin to call out on the name of Jesus, Luke goes on and he says this. He says, after this prayer, after they begin to pray, the meeting place shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And then they preached the word of God with what? Boldness, the very thing that they prayed for, the very thing that they asked for, that would be life-changing, that would take the message of the good news of Jesus Christ beyond Jerusalem, but out into Judea, Samaria, to all the ends of the earth, to where you and I have an opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus Christ and allow it to change us so that we can deliver that same message and be a part of this life-changing message for the world around us. It's so amazing what happened in this very moment. And you're, stopping, you're like, wait, hold up, time out. I thought we already said that a couple weeks ago that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Correct. They were filled with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. But I love this. Think about this. A double portion now. They're already filled with the Holy Spirit. But God says, I'm not done with you yet. I've got more for you. I've got more of my power, more of my spirit. Why? Because I'm equipping you to do what I've created you to do. Praying for boldness. God, would you give us boldness? It's amazing what happens when we pray for boldness. That the church aligns around this boldness, around the, around the good news, uh, around the power of God, around the, around the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And here's what happened. All the believers were united in heart and mind. Imagine that. All the believers were united in heart and mind. It didn't say all the believers from all different backgrounds and all different diversities and all different. It, it didn't say that they just tolerated each other. And they just got by because, you know, there's an annoying person over here. There's this guy. We don't even know what he's saying over here. No, no. They were united in heart and mind. They all understood and knew what exactly they had come to do, what exactly God had called them to do. They aligned themselves on that, and they felt that what they owned, listen to this, this is crazy, was not their own, so they shared everything that they had. That's how you know you arrive at unity when it's not like, well, this is good enough for you, but this is all me. This is how you know when you arrive at unity, when, 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 you, when you don't look at others and say, well, oh man, I'm so, man, it's too bad that they're going through that. You know, I just wish that wouldn't happen. But, but you know what? Uh, I'm glad I don't have to worry about it because that's their issue. It's not my issue. You, you know, you arrive at unity when you're able to look around and say, you know what? That person has need. And you know what? I can look at what God has given me and I can recognize that, you know what? What God has placed in my hand, guess what? It's not all for me. It's just not my own, but I can, I can share it. I can come alongside, right? I can roll up my sleeves and I can do something about it. Why? Because we are the body of Christ. We are the church, which means we are the, the family of God. All the believers arrived at unity. Now, let's understand this for a moment because we're talking about boldness. Well, what am I saying when I'm talking about boldness? I'm saying boldness is this outspoken assurance, right? It's this courage and confidence to act without fear, to step out and begin to act without fear. That, that when, it, when it comes to, to your faith, just, just think about this for a second. Boldness is not this, this arrogance and this pride that, that many of us know in our culture and society. That's not what we're talking about when we're talking about boldness. With boldness comes a humility that chooses to surrender to God. And God fills us with his spirit, gives us a courage and a confidence to act without fear, even in the face of adversity. But let me ask you this question just for a second. When, when it comes to your faith, if you had to rate your level of boldness today on a scale of one to 10, what number would you give yourself? What number would you give yourself? And again, this is not to make you feel bad. But just think about it for a second. The number that first comes to mind, based on your answer, let me ask you this. Is there any opportunity to be bolder? Is there any opportunity to increase in your boldness? Yeah, the reason why I'm asking is because I would say me too. Me too. There's plenty of times that, that I need to begin to pray, God, I need you to give me boldness. And you're like, well, wait, don't, you're the pastor at the church. Like, how are you? I'm like, yeah, because I'm an ordinary person just like you, right? I, 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 and in spite of my own idiocies, in spite of my own mistakes and mess ups, in spite of my own stuff that I don't always get right, here's what I know. God's still active and at work and he's not given up. And the reality is if we were to call on his name and ask for boldness, that God would empower us with the very thing that he intended to give to us so that we can move out and be about what he's called us to do, right? That's what's so powerful about what this church experienced. That's where this confidence came from. That's this, where this, this assurance came from. Why? Because again, understand me, boldness is behavior born out of belief. And what you believe determines how you behave. Boldness is behavior born out of belief, and what you believe determines how you behave. I understand this. My heart and my desire for us as a church, that we would, we would recognize who we are, that we would, we would understand our identity in Christ, that, that we would seek God to allow God to empower us, to fill us with his spirit, so that we would no longer be content with being apathetic, 
we would no longer be content with just certain comfort levels. We, we would no longer be content with just mediocre and just, just status quo, but instead we would say, God, we want your greater. God, we want your best for us. God, we want to do the very things that you've called us to. God, we want to see miracles, signs, and wonders. God, we want to see our communities changed. God, we want to see chains broken. God, we want to see walls torn down. God, we want to see lives renewed. God, we want to see families restored. God, we want to see addictions broken. God, we want to see your power at work in and through us, your church. Your church. Why? Because we have a belief in you, Jesus. We know who you are, and we believe in who you are, and we believe that you can do what you said you would do. So Jesus, allow that belief to rise up in us so that we begin to live it out. I love that the, that the church begin to live it out, that these early Jesus followers begin to live it out. That's why it's so important to, to wrestle with the terms of what do you believe about Jesus? And, and when you arrive at what you believe about Jesus, does your life reflect what you believe about Jesus? Is the way you're going about life reflecting the very thing that you believe about Jesus? Because I'll be honest, sometimes we lack boldness. Sometimes we forget the difference that Jesus can make in a life. And sometimes we just we get so comfortable that, that, that we don't really tap into the power of God in our life. We, get, we come to a place where we have so many excuses and so many things that, that get in our way that we just say, well, we're too busy to be about the good things that Jesus is calling us to. What if in this season right now, that these last few months, what if God, just hypothetically, what if he's actually trying to strip things out of your life, remove things out of your life to get your attention? to get you to refocus back on what he has called your life for. He's powerful when you think about it. My guess is whatever he's called you to, it's going to require not only his power, but it's going to require some boldness. These early church leaders continue to, to share the good news. And as they begin to, to share the good news, many people who wouldn't even call themselves Jesus followers begin to, to see them in, in high esteem. They, they begin to say, you know what, there's something different about those people. And again, the religious leaders, they became jealous. And again, more persecution began to break out and they didn't know what to do with this movement. And so what did they do? Well, they threw them back in jail again. <laughs> they just said, let's just, let's just hold these guys to, to just, just to, we can stop the disruption. We got, we got to put pause on, on the things that they're saying because this thing's out of control. We're losing power. Nobody's listening to us. They're only listening to them. So let's just put a stop to them. And then Luke documents once again, the apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned now, not just by the Sanhedrin, but now the high priest is involved. I mean, this is top tier. I mean, this is like, hey, we've got some serious issues, right? But remember, there's something different about these Jesus people. They're filled with power. They're, they're filled with boldness. Next, they said, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. They, again, they didn't even want to say the name of Jesus. Isn't it interesting that the name of Jesus in the first century caused so much controversy? And yet we look at today in 2020, and, and quite possibly the name of Jesus still is stirring lots of controversy. And that, that some would say, well, I, I don't know that, that I, I would proclaim Jesus. I don't know if I can talk about Jesus here or there. That there's just something about the name Jesus. Just, just think about that for a second. He says, we told you not to teach in his name. He says, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you're determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. To which if I'm Peter and John, I'm like, we're not trying to make you guilty. You guys are guilty, right? Like the reality is, is that we remember, we told, remember our story? Like Jesus came, he said, I'm the Messiah. You guys said, no, you're not. He says, yes, I am. I mean, he just paraphrased the story, right? You guys said, no, we're going to do away with you. You killed him on a cross. You thought you had him dead and buried. He was gone. But yet, surprise, he rose again. Like you guys know the story. Why would we have to, you, this, you guys chose it. He says, but you're trying to, to make us be stuck in it. You're trying to make us live in it, right? And then he goes on and he says, and Peter and the other apostles replied, here's what you need to know about us. We must obey God rather than human beings. Think about that for a second. He says, Here, here's why we're doing what we're doing. You, you've asked us to stop over and over again, but the reality is we're not doing anything wrong. And, and I know that it doesn't meet your agenda and it doesn't make you feel good and, and it doesn't really uh, help your power position you know, very much, but, but you know what? 
There's a power that's greater than yours. There, there, there's a power that's higher than you. And his name is Jesus, right? At the name of Jesus, right? Every tongue would confess the name of Jesus. Every knee is going to have to bow at the name of Jesus. And the reality is, is we've already decided to follow Jesus. And so we're going to be obedient to Jesus and what he's calling us to do. We're not going to, we're not going to get so caught up in your fear tactics and trying to get us to, to stop what God has, has called us to do. Again, the council became furious, right? Somebody spoke up and said, you know what? We're paying too much time and attention to this. Just let these guys go. Just get out of here with these guys. Like, it's over. Like, in a few weeks, they'll be gone. Somebody else will, will, will take over. You know, like, we don't have to worry about this stuff anymore because this is just this is ridiculous. But the council have said, no, we understand that that could possibly be the case, but we're going to make our point clear. And what they did is they took these early Christ followers and they, they beat them. They, they, they flogged them. They, they, they physically assaulted them. Many of them with scars that they would have to carry for the rest of their life, telling them, we do not want you to share the name of Jesus ever again, to which point you would say, okay, finally, yeah. Um, if that came down to it for me, yeah, uh, I'd be out. I'd be like, okay, uh, time out, time out, right? This is getting, it's getting too real, right? Like, like it's getting physical now? Like, like no, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I mean, it's one thing to get, to get arrested and tried before the Sanhedrin, but, but, now, but now, like, it's getting physical? Listen to what Luke says about these Jesus followers. It says, the apostles left the Sanhedrin that day, rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace, for the name of Jesus. What? Wait. Time out. Is, is that? Is that? Yeah. They didn't hang their heads low. They didn't walk away in fear. They, they didn't say, okay, God, uh, I didn't sign up for this. Okay, God, but yeah, this is too much for me. No, they, they understood that they, that they were willing to be obedient to God. And they were understanding that your obedience to God will sometimes bring opposition that you never saw coming. And in that opposition that you never saw coming, you have a choice to remain obedient to God and continue to serve God because you know that God is going to get the glory out of this or you choose to shrink back in fear and potentially miss out on what God has in store for your life. This gets me every single time because sometimes I think when my life is going crazy and things are going a little too hard, how many times do you just want to quit? How many times do you want to say, oh, I, I, can't, I can't do this anymore? And the reality is, is we got guys that are, are rejoicing at the fact that in their suffering, they know that God is still active, that God is still at work, and that God is far from done. So they're going to continue to lean in. And I love this. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped. Might as well just say it. Can't stop, won't stop. Day after day, house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is King of Kings, that Jesus is Lord of Lords, that, that Jesus makes all the difference. What would that look like for you and me? What would that look like for you and me to just, to, just, to just lean in a little further and begin to live with great boldness? In our last few moments together today, I just want you to just document these things. I want you to just write them down. I think you should, should know about these things. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on them because I think they're, they're just they're really self-explanatory, but I think they're so incredibly important. They're, they're, they're really tangible. Sometimes we just want to know, like, how do I make this apply to my life? How, 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 how can I be bold. And I think there's there's lots of ways that you can be bold. I understand this. I'm, I'm not talking about being obnoxious. I'm not talking about, like said, being prideful and, and arrogant, right? And I know some of you are pushing back. You're like, well, you know what? I love Jesus and all, but I'm just not, I'm just not very outspoken. I'm just kind of a quiet person. You know, I'm just, I just kind of behind the scenes and, you know, I don't really have that much of education. I don't know a lot about scripture. I, I don't really know any special Bible stories or anything like that. And, and I would just say, congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, that's, that's perfect. Because apparently your perceived ordinariness about yourself, right, is actually a prerequisite to God's power being alive and active in your life. You, you can do this. You can lean in. You can lean in with a newfound boldness. So what does boldness, living with boldness, look like? It means, it means saying yes to Jesus. Bold is first saying yes to Jesus. What do I mean? Acts 4.13 says, they took inventory. They could see that these men, they had been with Jesus. Spiritual boldness comes from knowing Jesus. It's relationship with Jesus. It's, it's time with Jesus builds 
faith in Jesus. And that faith in Jesus results in boldness. And that boldness results in spiritual results. Right? Not just personal results where oh, I get everything I want. No, no, no. That, that's not how the gospel reads. The gospel reads that, that, that a boldness results in, in spiritual results that don't just affect you, but it affects the world around you. Right? Our boldness is based out of Jesus' power and strength, not, not our own. Right? It's, it's, it's this, this ultimate goal for us, though, understand this, is not just boldness for boldness sake, but you need to know that the, the goal for you and I is more of Jesus. More of Jesus. Why would we say yes to Jesus? Because the more of Jesus, the more we lean into Jesus, the, the more boldness that you have. Why? Because boldness is a byproduct of a relationship with Jesus. Relationship with Jesus. Living with boldness would be this. But bold is choosing obedience over easy. It's choosing obedience over easy. Acts 5, 29. We, we must obey God rather than, than human beings, right? That, that sometimes we know what God is calling us to. We know what God is putting on our heart. We, we know what God is leading us towards. But, but, but you know, we, 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 uh, we wait. We, we excuse it. We, we, you know, we, we all this. Let me help you with something. Delayed disobedience or obedience is still disobedience. Right? Delayed obedience is still disobedience. Partial, partial obedience is still disobedience. Okay? It's, it's easy to say, you know what, this is too hard. It's easy to say, ah, I don't know if I can do that. It's easy to say, you know what, I don't really know that that's God telling me to do that. God, did you really say to, to give uh, uh, money to that? I, uh, get thee behind me. Say, you know, it's like we get all confused and everything. Like, it's like No, the reality is, is God is doing something in your heart, and you get to choose obedience over easy. I'm encouraging you today. Choose obedience. Obedience leads to boldness. I love this. Bold bold is saying something when it'd be easier to say nothing. It's saying something when it'd be easier to say nothing. What, what are you talking about? I'm saying when it's, it's, easy, it's easy to say nothing, just to avoid all things, just to turn a blind eye to all things. It's a lot harder to have a conversation even when it's a difficult conversation, even when it's an awkward conversation. You know, it's, it's, it's really easy to just avoid it and overlook things. You know, it's a lot harder. A lot harder is holding someone accountable. Actually, actually saying, no, no, that, that's not okay. Calling someone out in grace and truth for the goal of their benefit, of learning and growing. That's a lot harder. It's easier just to say nothing, but you know what? God's given us a voice. God's given us a conscience. God's given us a standard to live by, and we should lean into that. We should be willing to say something even when it's easier to just say nothing. What if we choose to lean in, to, to allow God to fill us with boldness, to begin to share the good news of Jesus, to have healthy conversations, to create healthy dialogue. See, see, see bold, bold is not only saying something when it'd be easier to say nothing, but, but bold is also removing the obstacles and creating opportunities. We choose to remove obstacles and we create opportunities. And this is who we are. This is who we are as a church, constantly removing the obstacles and barriers that stand between people knowing Jesus and inviting God, God, would you stretch out your hand? God, would you stretch out your hand with your power, your miracles, your signs, your wonders? God, would we see, would we see, God, your will be done right here. God, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Would it happen right here in and through City Line Church? It's time that we start looking for those opportunities. God, if you can use anything, God, you can use us. So where do we begin? I firmly believe that it begins in prayer. Boldness begins in prayer. We see this lived out in this church. Boldness begins in prayer. As they got together, they begin to pray and seek God. They begin to call on the powerful name of Jesus, and they ask for boldness. Let me ask you, when's the last time you prayed for boldness? When's the last time you prayed that your life would draw attention to Jesus? When's the last time you got before God and you said, God, if you can use anything, you can use me? So we have a choice. We can play it safe or we can seize the life that God has for us. Because the church is a movement and it's moving. It can't stop. It won't stop. And you're invited to be a part of it. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for today. Jesus, I thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Jesus, we proclaim that we want more of you, more of your power, 
Jesus, give us the courage to live a life that honors you. Jesus, would you fill us with boldness? Jesus, would you enable us to speak about your good news by your power and your strength alive in us? God, would you send us out into our world around us? God, into our communities, onto our jobs, or in our families, Lord, to be salt and light. Lord, to, to be a church, Lord, that is bold, Lord, that is willing to take a stand. Lord, that is willing to have conversations. Lord, that is willing to speak into things. Lord, that is willing to roll up our sleeves and come alongside. God, your church is active. God, your church is not passive. Your church doesn't sit back and watch. Your church doesn't sit back and judge. Instead, your church gets involved. It comes alongside. It begins to lead the way. So, Father, would you do a work in us, Father, so that your glory would be known, so that your name would be lifted high, so that others would come to know you. We give you all glory, honor, and praise for it. In Jesus' name. Thanks for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed the service either at home or at one of our watch parties. For more information about City Line, you can find us at our website, social media, or the City Line app. Thanks again, and we hope to see you next week.